Hello, everybody. It's Harry from Upload VR, and I'm here today with Melanie Harkey, who's the project director of Lost Recipes and senior game design manager at Shell Games. Melanie, thank you for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to talk about the game. Yeah, yeah. So I figured we're here, of course, to talk about Lost Recipes, which came out very recently. I'm sure many people will be aware of it. But before we get into that game, I just want to talk, I guess, a bit about your personal history, like what games you've worked on. You've been with Shell Games since 2005, I think, so it's quite a long time. What's been oh, your yeah. kind of personal history with the studio and, and how did you kind of get to where you are now? Oh, yeah. So I started working at the studio when I was actually an undergrad at Carnegie Mellon University. I was taking a class with Jesse Shell, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center. And I was just like, I just wanted a job, honestly, that was more interesting than the one that I currently had at that point, which I was working for the engineering department, just filing papers, basically. So I went to Jesse. I was like, hey, Jesse, is there any sort of job available? Can I be like a TA or something? And he's like, well, actually, I just started a studio across the river. Do you want to work there? I was like, yes, I will put my foot in that door. So I started out doing QA for some of our very early games with Shell Games. We were working on like Disney games. We were doing a first person shooter that was like with water guns. So I worked on QA for that. And then, you know, we did a lot more Disney stuff. We did Disney Pixie Hollow, Disney Fairies, MMO, and I was doing QA on that, but also then sort of transitioned to doing design on it as well designing some of the mini games for it and then <laughs> I don't know Shell Games works on so many different things I've worked on some theme park rides with them most recently I've been doing a lot of educational VR experiences like this one and some therapeutic VR experiences but I also work on a lot of PBS and Fred Rogers projects so Daniel Tiger which is a show for toddlers based off of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and so I make a lot of mobile games for that. So, you know, I've kind of run the gambit here in the 17 yeah. years. Yeah, it's very interesting. So something I'd like to touch on, because I think uh, it's an interesting line with Lost Recipes. How would you explain Lost Recipes as an experience? Would you say it's a game? Is it an educational app? Is it a simulator? It's kind of somewhere between both. How would you describe Lost Recipes? What is the, the game or, you know, app to you? How would you describe it personally, I guess, or as a studio? Yeah, I think I would consider it a experience more than a game, even though it definitely has some game elements. Of course, you're being scored and there's lots of different mechanics in it. But in the end, the real goal was for it to be kind of like a vacation. Like you get into it and you feel like, yeah, I actually went to this place and had this sort of authentic cooking experience with someone who really knows how to cook these meals. So I think it's much more like an experience than necessarily a game. We did want to attract people who didn't potentially consider themselves gamers, though I personally think everyone's a gamer, but you know, they might not title themselves that. Instead, it's people who want to use the quest as maybe like a lifestyle tool, right? We, we got a bunch of people when they're play testing that said, you know, I haven't played any games. All I play is Beat Saber. That's it, right? And they don't consider that a game either. They're like, that's my exercise routine. Yeah, yeah. So we wanted to get those people in and have them play this. We had a lot of people after the play test that were like, oh, I didn't know they made games that are like this for, for mm. me. <laughs> so yeah. that was really exciting. That's super interesting. I'm guessing an intentional decision, which I really liked. It's designed to be very slow. And, you yeah. know, there's no pressure. I love that when you put something on the floor, the little chef's like, oh, I'll get that. There's no <laughs> kind of stress or almost timer. Like the timers are very kind of lenient. So a, a quick overview for those who are watching who maybe don't know much about the game. Basically, there's three different cultures with different recipes in each. You go through and you follow these instructions given by chefs from each culture on how to prepare the food. It's not quite as complicated as a true simulator. It's simplified versions of things which is really cool. First of all, how did development actually start on this? When did you guys come up with the idea? How did the idea come to be? Where did that kind of process begin, I guess? Originally, we knew we wanted to do an educational VR experience. We have these two really great sort of entertainment-based uh, VR games, I Expect You to Die and Until You Fall. 
and we were working with Oculus Education. So we knew we wanted to do an educational experience. We just started brainstorming of like, what is it about VR and education that's so powerful? And it's really about, of course, presence being there in the location. And then we have made a couple of other educational VR experiences before. Very early on, we converted one of our mobile apps, Water Bears, to Water Bears VR. And then we also have Hall Ups Champions. We knew we wanted to take lessons from that, but we knew we didn't want to be like a classroom experience. We wanted to be something that just a normal everyday person who's curious about things, because we all like to learn, we might want to experience. And so that's really where I think cooking came from. That was like, this is a thing that lots of people like to do. And of course, we started working on this in the middle of the pandemic. We'd all been at home for a long time. And so we started thinking about well, like, I just don't want to cook just in my normal house because I'm in my house 24 seven. I want to cook and experience these places that maybe right now, especially I can't get to. That really um, helped push us into exploring what if you were cooking in locations that are not like your house? How did people cook in ancient times? How did they cook in like prehistoric times even was one of the conversations. I and mean, that really got us excited. So that's how we came to it. Yeah. That's another thing I wanted to touch on. How did you settle on the three cultures and the recipes that you picked? I imagine there must've been lots of discussion on where you could have taken it or where you could have gone with that, what recipes you would have wanted to include it and stuff like that. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we talked about a lot of different places and it really came down to what could we get good data for? That was very important to us because we did want this to be a very authentic, real experience. So we wanted to make sure it was a place that we could find a human that was willing to work with us, you know, for the long term. We wanted to have people at the very early to research, but also looking at the art later on, everything. So that was important to us. We also, of course, did just pull the office and pull the team of like, what's exciting? What are you interested in? We had a book, a set of books is called Cooking Through History. And that gave us a lot of good overview of the world and what might be interesting places. We have interesting tools that maybe are less familiar to us are things that maybe just look different than your current modern kitchen. So that helped inform us. But then really, even with that, we had a pretty big list of like 10 places or so, and we had to narrow it down to three. Then it was really picking out who could we find, with the exception maybe of Maya. <laughs> I think Maya was just so compelling to us. I don't know how your childhood history class went, but when I learned about the Maya people, it, as a kid, and this probably shows the, the problems with social studies <laughs> in the United States, uh, I thought they were like non-existent, right? That like they were wiped out. Uh, and that's totally not true. The Maya people still mm. thrive and still exist and they spread throughout the entire region. That felt just something that we really latched on pretty early on, even though it was hard to find a subject matter consultant for Maya. We really wanted it. We wanted to show that environment. So that one was a little more, we were willing to stick it out to find someone. Yeah. And so that's the other thing I was going to ask with the subject matter consultants, from what you're saying, I gather that they were basically involved from almost the beginning. It wasn't like they just came on to record the lines. Is that right? It was a full consultation process through development as well. Oh yeah. So we have two separate people. There's the voice actors, which we wanted yep. to be very authentic voices. But then we also had these subject matter consultants. We had connected early on with the Kenner room at Carnegie Mellon University. They had helped connect us to some professors of the different sort of historical and also cultural background so that we could work with these people. And we had oftentimes weekly meetings with them because we had so much to talk about. It's not just the food. It's What's the language that you would use? How would the scene be arranged? What's the decoration on the walls? What sort of material would they have? They didn't always have the answer. Sometimes they would point us to resources, books to, to look at, but it was just good to have someone who was connected to the culture working with us the entire way. Cause I'm not Chinese. I don't yeah. know about Song Dynasty, China. We really wanted to make sure that it was authentic. So we had to get someone who was connected to that culture and, and who knew that history. 
And then, of course, the voice actors as well. We wanted them, you know, you're not going to find anyone from ancient Greece. Like, <laughs> that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you can find someone from modern Greece who, mm-hmm. who's willing to, to be a voice actor. It was great. We, you know, got very authentic voices. I feel really proud yeah. of that. The whole thing comes off as really authentic and you can tell the research has been done. I also love that it, it strikes a balance between a lot of the actual kitchen environments feel like they're from another time, but also feel close enough to my actual kitchen that I kind of knew my way around. Even if you've not cooked with a a wood fire, made pita in a wood fire oven, everything's in similar places or you kind of understand the layout. One of the things that I also did was I ended up going back and cooking. I did the um, steamed fish recipe in my own kitchen, which I didn't even really plan to do. I just had the ingredients and realized and went, oh, I'm going to try this out because I did it today in the game and it worked out really well, which was a real amazing feeling it's educational but was the intention to actually make things that perhaps people could take something from and do it their own kitchen and there's a level of familiarity there or is that just like a happy coincidence i guess a little of both i will say kitchens were actually much more similar to modern day kitchens than i think we expected originally That was surprising, but we did have to modify some of them. For example, in ancient Greece, typically a house wouldn't have that oven inside their kitchen. They might, if they're a very wealthy house, they might have it out in the courtyard, but often more likely they will go to a public baker and get their stuff cooked there. So we did have to do some modifications because we wanted to have it all be like your kitchen so that you could see how those ancient processes translated to your modern day kitchen. It was interesting too, because I found I remembered a lot more than I thought I would as well, just by virtue of having almost done it. At that level of kind of presence and immersion, I did go back and skip through the recipe to give myself a refresher, did some of it again. And I was like, oh, okay. But a lot of it I remembered. And I think what's really cool too, is that a lot of the focus is non-specific. It's very much like a splash of this its ratios this much double that so you can take that no matter whether you're using a cup of something or a tablespoon or whatever you can adjust that yourself very easily and and it's way more memorable so i really loved that i thought it was an amazing byproduct that i wasn't even really expecting to come from my time with the game it was really special to feel like i had learned something without going through a recipe book either it didn't feel like i'd sat there and, and read something Uh, or watch something, I felt like I'd done it, and then I did it again, but not in VR. Often you do things the other way, where you do it first in real life, and then you're comparing it. That was really cool. That really stuck out to me as something that I didn't expect, but lovely to have happened. Yeah, we definitely wanted people to try these recipes in their own homes. We didn't want people to get bogged down in like super details. And in fact, a lot of ancient recipes, they don't, they're not going to have those super yeah. details anyways. It's not like yeah. it has a list of like, yeah, they used a cup, a tablespoon. They yeah. don't have that level of detail for a recipe from ancient Greece. And we didn't feel we needed it. In fact, when we first started doing the recipe cards that are in the game, we had a lot more details originally when we first put those recipe cards together. What we found is people got really bogged down in the detail of like making sure that the color of the liquid that they've made exactly matched the picture that's on there and that they measured it exactly. It started to feel really stressful to people. That's not what we're going for at all. We want you to feel accomplished that you can do these things in cooking. So we did purposely move the details to more things like ratios and things that were easier for people to translate and be like, yeah, that that seems good enough. And then we also added, of course, the sort of gamey feedback, little sparkles to say, yeah, you've done it. It's good. You've put in enough wine. Yeah. Um, So that way people didn't have to worry too much. As someone who really likes to cook generally, I find too that people who don't cook often get bogged down with stuff like an actual recipe because they get almost overwhelmed. Like you said, it becomes a stressful thing of like, oh, I've got to be putting in the exact amounts of this and doing this and this and this. Um, not enough people free themselves of that could then realize you can look at a recipe and completely adjust a lot of it. And it, it still often works. I think there are very few things in cooking where you don't have a lot of leeway. I would like to think that someone might come into this uh, and go, oh, cooking in general is not as involved or technical as I might think it is. It's a lovely way to 
reset your mind and reset the expectations of what cooking can be coming at it from an enjoyment first perspective, as opposed to, oh, it's a list, it's a chore that I have to do. I'm just ticking things off. We're about, what, two or three weeks away from launch now. Are you guys happy with how it's gone? What's the feedback been? What have you been hearing from people? It's been very positive. I think we've got lots of feedback of people, you know, sort of saying that this is not like other cooking experiences. I think a lot of, especially VR, but I think even just in general, VR, cooking games tend to be frantic and yeah. sort of silly. It's all about the plate spinning. Let me get this thing done really fast. Serve as yeah. many people as possible. And, and mayhem uh, and so as well. I... Lots of chaotic, <laughs> like yeah. things are going everywhere. People are chucking things at each other unintentionally, and intentionally. I certainly love those games, but yeah. like we did purposely try to make something uh, different and unique. People have really picked up on, this is a game where I can sort of relax. I can chill in it. And that's, that's definitely the vibe we were going for. We wanted people to feel like this is a cozy vacation experience. The, the feedback has been very, very positive. We're very excited about the reviews that we've gotten thus far. So uh, yeah. I think it's going well. <laughs> and can we expect any updates in the future? Have you guys considered implementing hand tracking? Is that something that you tried and maybe became too complicated. I can see it making it more stressful because there's more to kind of think about as a player. Is that something you looked at? Because it feels like it almost could work maybe depending. Yeah. So we actually tried early on to do like hand presence because right now we're very job simulators term tomato presence, right? You pick up something and your hand turns to that something. Um, really, it just became much harder to do things. People started to look at the technique of how they're holding the hand. Mm -hmm. And I think it took some of the enjoyment away. I will say it also made somewhat problematic for things like stirring because we do a lot of fakery with physics so that things don't go flying everywhere because yeah, whereas <laughs> we didn't when you're want that hands, feel. Yeah, I can see how you Yeah, it. exactly. In real life, when I'm holding a, a thing and stirring, my spoon hits the edge. I don't bust through yeah. the pot. But of mm. course, in VR, you know, I don't have that real physical pot with me, so I can totally bust through the sides of the pot. It made things feel like they were unintentionally doing stuff. We, yeah. we didn't want that. We wanted every motion that the user does to feel it is a physics game. So <laughs> I'm sure yeah. it still has some long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But in general, we wanted people to feel like they had control, that they weren't accidentally throwing things. As far as an update goes, that's really stay tuned. I can't really speak to that yet, but we really like the product. We really enjoyed working on it and we'd certainly love to do more, I think. Yeah. Cause that's the only other thing I was going to ask, which I'm sure you'll probably give a similar response was it feels right, but for DLC with new cultures or whatnot, even if you can't confirm with the, you know, DLC is on the way. Is that kind of something you guys thought about? Like, oh, we could expand this, adding another culture or adding more. Obviously you had lots of ideas at the start. <laughs> oh, oh, certainly. And we have like full lists of yeah. other environments that we are excited about exploring, even with some reference people that we might reach out to. I think that that is certainly something that we, as a team while making it, we're definitely thinking about and very excited about no promises or anything but yeah. but we'll stay tuned hopefully yeah before we go is there anything you'd like to say to people who have played the game any message you want to put out there shout outs thank yous anything like that anything you'd like to say to the community behind the game oh well certainly i, I would love to thank our subject matter consultants and our uh, voice actors because i think without them we wouldn't have a game and really, I just hope everyone gains some new appreciation of both how different and also how similar all of our cultures are, how familiar cooking is, and how it connects us all together as people. Yeah, lovely. Totally agree. Well, thank you very much for joining me. That was a, a lovely conversation. Yeah, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.